Welcome to the Science Lecture Series for this year. We've already finally found it. Good job. <laughs> <laughs> I've been turned around in this end of camp. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, And join me in welcoming our first speaker, Dr. Ron Hart. <laughs> so, uh, let me introduce, for those of you that don't know, Dr. Ron Hart. He's been here for 33 years, so I think just about everyone does know, except for me for some of the students here. Um, but anyway, Ron uh, came to us uh, in the late 70s with a charge to develop a major bio program, and he has done so with great success. Our major bio program is a model as uh, Ron never sees tell telling us. Uh, <laughs> I first met Ron about 20 years ago on the volleyball court. Uh, when I came here in the late 80s, uh, volleyball, regular Friday volleyball, again, some of you faculty know about it, been running for about uh, 15 years at that point. Uh, it's an interesting story how that got started, but we won't go there today. Uh, but Ron came along in the early days, apparently, in the late 70s, and, and noticed how folks were playing and said, you know, uh, this game does have rules. <laughs> so, from what I'm told, he sort of read away the riot act, and the game's been at a slightly higher level ever since. Maybe he came Barbara from UC Santa Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, some of you folks uh, have seen the flyer for the talk and know some of these biological or, uh, biographical facts about Ron, like the fact that he spent three years of his childhood in Burma, and he attributes his initial interest in biology from that time. Uh, running around the backyard and coming back to his mother, and she had to pick leeches off of her for several minutes every time she did that. Um, funny story. Made me love biology. Yes. Uh, Ron is also an avid collector of tropical fish, especially his killifish, if I remember correctly. Killifish. killifish. Uh, and brings them back from the Amazon and the parts unknown all the time. He has 45 aquariums in his fish house. Uh, so he'll be spending some of his retirement time on that. His last day before retirement is tomorrow. How special. Wow. Also in his retirement time, he plans to grow more organic vegetables, make wine, really nice, uh, and travel and get a few more fish. This is his plan. Uh, today, Ron's going to be talking to us about the human species from a biological point of view. Where do we come from? Who are we, considering that we are part animal and part sentient being? What have we done and what will we leave as our legacy? Good questions for all of us, but especially for Ron on his next to last day of the college. So let's hear Ron talk to us about all these lovely things. Thank you. I've been fortunate enough to give uh, a number of science lecture talks. I can't even remember the number of them, but. I know Steve Marsden's favorite was everything you always wanted to know about a fish but were afraid to ask, but I thought that had a kind of limited appeal, so we're not going to do that one. Uh, today just kind of opened up Pandora's box. A biologist reflects on our life and times, and I'd like to just read an introduction from a book that was loaned to me by Victoria Buresh. It's called The Darwinian Tourist. Introduction. Our understanding of the living world can always be deepened by a Darwinian perspective. As we look at the world through evolutionary eyes, we come away with a renewed sense of wonder about life's astounding present-day diversity, along with a new appreciation of that diversity's fourth dimension, its long evolutionary history. When we think about our planet from an evolutionary point of view, it also becomes achingly clear that when we lose a species or an ecosystem, we lose many millions of years of history, and each such loss reduces the ecological diversity on which the survival of our species and the entire biosphere depend. Um, if any of you watch television, I mean, this theme was there last night in Terra Nova, and the whole idea that we are slowly destroying the planet, that humans are gonna become the only living thing on the planet, and that ultimately we will have to find another place to live. Um, this talk is more hopeful than that. But uh, let's, let's take off. Um, let's start with the beginnings of humanity, the beginnings of the human species. The Earth formed about four and a half billion years ago, and the very first life appeared about 3.8 billion years ago. It was heterotrophic life. It had to feed on something. It wasn't like plants where they could make their own food. And what it fed on was an organic soup that was made by lightning and other high energy forms that existed in the early Earth. Uh, the problem with this is that these heterotrophs ran out of food. 
and there was no replenishment, there was no photosynthesis. So we think it may have taken a couple of attempts before life took hold, right? So life wasn't just boom, it was the, they think it was the third or fourth attempt that it finally stuck. By 543 million years ago, most modern animal phyla had evolved, including the chordata, the phylum of future humans. And it's interesting, the early chordates um, are represented today by something called a tunicate, which is a little blob of jelly that has cellulose in its external covering, and it sucks plankton like this. It has no intelligence, but it's larva. The larval form was the thing that was smarter, more mobile, had higher developed senses. So we're probably the product of larval evolution. We call it pedogenesis, when a larva gets the ability to reproduce. So our origins are kind of bizarre. The next 500 plus million years saw dramatic climatic change, four plus mass extinctions in the seas and on land. Um, you will know about the dinosaurs, you don't know about the bryozoans and the uh, uh, all the other groups, I'm not going to go into all of those. But life was self-sustaining, fluctuating, and dynamic. The world worked, and then we came along. <coughs> so the appearance of humans and change, because once the human species and its tool use and its intelligence and its ability to manipulate its environment came around, the world would never be the same. And you can say, for better or worse, the artist people would say it was an improvement. Some biologists would question that. But we find several hominid species about 2.5 to 3.5 million years ago. Now, folks, when I taught majors bio, I used to talk about you know, the whole idea of coming up with um, evolutionary origins and different hypotheses for the origin of humans. And I used to talk about the great thing about taxonomy was nobody ever agrees. So I showed him a, a, an overhead, and I couldn't find it, that showed the current thoughts on the origin of humans. There were 14 competing hypotheses, 14 family trees that didn't agree at all. So I'm not going to pretend that I know where we came from. The paleontologists <laughs> don't know where we came from. But we do find our origins very well represented about two and a half to three and a half million years ago. These organisms, you've heard of Lucy, Don Johansson's discovery. But Lucy was upright. Um, she had binocular vision that was color vision. And she had um, opposable thumbs, which is a pre-adaptation of tool use, also convenient for setting a volleyball. Um, <laughs> humans give birth to one or few highly dependent offspring that stay with their mother for a year or more. They appear to have been social with male hierarchical dominance and sexual dimorphism. I'm sure you all know what male hierarchical dominance is, uh, but sexual dimorphism means that males and females don't look the same. If you've ever had goldfish, they look the same but humans clearly male and female are different. And at this time, um, they existed in variants, including carnivores and an herbivorous form or two. Um, which do you think we came from, the carnivore or the herbivore? No. <laughs> the carnivore. We, we came from primar primarily a carnivor carnivorous origin, and the opposable thumb allowed grasping and ultimately tool use. Supposedly, the, the opposable thumb came from our life, our ancestors in the trees. And ultimately, the opposable thumb led to world domination. Because with the thumb, you can manip manipulate the environment. Right? <laughs> Carnivory in a social life cycle probably selected for larger brains and the basis for modern societies. Without our brains, we don't have social structure that we have today. We don't have government we don't have the kinds of wonderful disputes we have. And our large brains need a fat-rich food supply supported by a meat-rich diet, including fish and mollusks. Interestingly enough, if you look at biology and you look at all the animals on the planet, you find very few intelligent herbivores. Basically, when your food runs away from you and fights back, it, it selects for intelligence. If the food sits there and you can suck it in, or it just sits there and you munch it and chew it. I mean, this does not lead to great intelligence, right? <laughs> Sorry, folks. Now, there's two types of whales. You figure out which ones are intelligent. The large brain social lifestyle and the ability to manipulate the environment with tools set the stage for the animal species that would totally change the face of the earth. Um, if anybody saw the movie The Emerald Forest about the Amazon, and it's about basically a conflict where, you know, uh, shall we say, Western world developers are destroying the rainforest and you know, exploiting the resources, and then you have the forest people that are being chased away and such. 
What separates from other, us from other animals? Only a few animals dramatically modify their environment as much as humans. Tropical termites, a rare example, devour the forest and build huge termite mounds that support termite colonies. If you remember the Emerald Forest, what did they call the Western people? The termite people, because they came in and chewed up the forest and turned it into bare earth. And only termites do this. And if you've been in an area where termites have been through in the tropics, it's basically nothing but these mounds. This shot here is actually a shot of a termite mound that's used in South Africa for gold mining. Because what happens is the termites go through and just devour everything and carry it into their mound. And since gold is heavy, you can actually do mining by going into termite mounds. But humans and termites create habitat that supports their own species, but simplifies the environment. And simplifying the environment means that very few things other than humans can live in it. And this simplification um, tends to favor what we call generalists. Generalists are organisms that can adapt to a number of different types of conditions. Good examples are rats and mice, ants, cockroaches, crows and ravens, pigeons, and coyotes, all your favorite creatures, right? But if we continue to simplify the world, this is the species diversity you're looking forward to. Okay, humans as animals, our physical limitations. The human body has been described as the paragon of the creator's work, but we're actually built more like a post-World War II British sports car, all right? If anybody's ever owned a Triumph or an MG or an Austin or any of these things. Um, engine from a 1940s tractor, suspension from a taxi, an assemblage of available parts, we're basically built from the junk bin. Whatever fish had, and later early amphibians and such had, this was all modified through evolution into this body we have, but it is not a paragon of creation. <laughs> Chordate ancestors were fish-like with weight supported from a horizontal backbone. Water also reduced the effective weight of the organs. So here's the backbone of the fish floating along in the water with all the organs supported from the backbone. And if you actually do an, uh, anatomical dissections, you know that everything's connected uh, to the backbone, right? By mesenteries and septa and such. But down beneath, you can reach around underneath the organs, right? So we're basically derived from this model. The move to, move to land and later bipedalism left us very compromised. So here's our fish skeleton, and here you have the organs hanging down. Imagine a fish skeleton with two men carrying bananas on a pole. Okay, here's all the bananas. Now imagine the pole going like this. What happens to the bananas? Right? This is your body, folks. Because no longer is the weight supported from the back, it's now sliding down and putting a lot of stress right here in the lower back. So the abdominal mass pushes down and out, and the result is paunch. So paunch is inevitable. <laughs> you feel better? If anybody's been to physical therapy, what do they tell you these days? Develop your core, right? <laughs> And your core basically includes developing the peripheral muscles. The little ones at the back are not that strong, but your abdominal muscles can be developed and the muscles along the side, and that can support the paunch a little better. <laughs> the consequences of the weighty shift. As our verticality is only supported by tiny back muscles, the lower back becomes a focal point that is easily injured. Bipedal bipedalism pushes our skeletal layout to the limit. If you actually look at a human skeleton, I could have brought one in. The, the backbone goes like this, and then at the bottom, when you get down to the lumbar vertebrae, they get really big. They actually increase in size. You're taking anatomy, right? She's got that. But you see these big lumbar vertebrae, L1, 2, 3, and then you take a look at our pelvis, and our pelvis has big flares on it, and that's to support these muscles back here, your gluteus, right? And you know why our gluteus are so big? Because it's holding the upper body up, right? That's what it is, that big booty is all the muscle that's holding you vertical, right? <laughs> Lower back pain is inevitable and is exacerbated by excess abdominal body weight and or pregnancy. Anything that pushes you out here is gonna lever that and create problems because you try to compensate. And the excess weight also pushes down on the urinary bladder and reduces its size dramatically. Can pregnant women hold their bladders rail? Well, anybody been across country with a pregnant woman? <laughs> you get to visit every restroom along the way. Right? Because quite frankly, all that weight of the developing fetus is pushing down and compressing the urinary bladder to nothing. Intelligent design, right folks? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Half
Having your bum in the air is preferred. This is a little bit of uh... <laughs> Mike mentioned I was raised in Burma, so I know it's British. That's Although where dangerous. bum. Our ancestral quadrupedal primate ancestors had their tails in the air. Blood from the anal veins returned to the heart by gravity. Most of you don't know this, but your heart basically pumps blood out of the heart through arteries to the capillaries, and then blood pressure just drops to nothing. I mean, it's very, very small. The way blood gets back to the heart is either by gravity, and there's little one-way valves that help, or by muscle contraction. If somebody's bedridden, you move them around a little bit, and what that does is cause the muscles to contract on the veins and push the blood through these one-way valves back to the heart. Well, our evolutionary origins included a bum that was always high in the air. One-way valves never evolved, right? Didn't need to. That's always the highest part in the body. So the blood flows back to the heart from the anal veins. Now you put us up like this. Here's your anal veins. How, how is that blood going to get back to the heart? It doesn't. It tends to sit there, and it tends to push out and create what we call hemorrhoids. And so this is a predictable problem of our intelligently designed body, all right? <laughs> the cure for hemorrhoids is keeping one's bum in the air and letting the <laughs> blood flow back to the heart by gravity. Until... <coughs> Gordy taught me this one, OK. So, what do you mean exactly? <laughs> okay. The human knee bioengineering farce. I was going to call it bioengineering joke, bioengineering catastrophe. Basically, the, the knee that is in a quadrupedal organism, dog, cat, horse, whatever, um, is perfectly well adapted to doing just this, right? It goes back and forth, back and forth. It doesn't rotate. It doesn't do a whole lot of other things. It goes back and forth. It's a lever arm. And it's very stable. You don't see horses blowing out their knees as they're running in the Kentucky Derby, do you? You do? Is it common? It's not common. They're more likely to break an ankle, right? OK. Anyway, quadruped knees go back and forth. Our knee, which was evolved for bipedalism, is a horrible compromise of the original design, sort of that World War II sports car thing, and uh, prone to all sorts of tendon, cartilage, and ligament injuries, no matter how fit you are. Just read the injury reports for the NFL, folks, every week as we're going into the Sunday games, and you'll count innumerable people that are out because of knee injuries, mostly to ACLs and uh, lateral medial meniscus, all that good stuff. If possible, the freely rotating human shoulder is even more unstable and never the same after an injury, right? It's held together by soft tissue, and once you blow it out, it's very difficult to get it back to where it was. And again, these were compromises on a quadruped body that allowed our ancestors to do motions that were part of bipedalism and living in the trees. It's nearly impossible to support the intelligent design argument using the human body as evidence. Otherwise, there wouldn't be so darn many orthopedic surgeons. All right. As reproductive modules, our best years are behind us. If you take a look at the Richard Dawkins idea, the selfish gene, really, really all any organism is is a vessel that supports successful reproduction. If the vessel does support successful reproduction, the traits of that vessel are selected for, and those genes move forward. If that vessel is not well adapted to successful reproduction, those genes are selected against, right? So certain things are selected for as the product of reproduction. Our bodies are at their peak only during our optimal reproductive years, and this is between 13 and 26. And you might say, oh, no, that's all wrong. Modern society, who cares about modern society? I'm talking about Lucy, folks. Our bodies go back to 1.5 million years ago. It's basically when we stop evolving below the neck. We might be less hairy, but the basic layout of Lucy is pretty much like our layout, right? So this body is a reproductive vessel. And that reproductive lifespan was 13 to 26, all right? So your body is at its best from 13 to 26. And the bottom line is, as I used to tell my students, it's all downhill after 27, okay? <laughs> everything, everything that your body does well. I know, I noticed there's no applause, all right. But it is all downhill after 27. What have we done to counteract that because we've expanded our lifespan, modern medicine, physical therapy, diet, so on and so forth? What's the proof of the downhill after 27 hypothesis? There was a quote in the sporting section of the Times 
where Julius Caesar said that men are not suited to fight in wars after 30 years. So once you're 30 years old, he, he implied that you're no good anymore. The military is a little kinder. They'll take you up to, no, they take you up to 27. 30. It used to be 26. When I, 26 was the day. 26 was, what? Okay, well, at the time, <laughs> at the time that this author was involved with the whole issue of being in the 60s during the Vietnam War, once you were 27, you were not draftable, okay? And so they knew. Uh, sprinters, pro running backs, and long jumpers begin to fade in their late 20s. Distance, run, distance running is different as it involves mental discipline, not sheer athleticism. I was a distance runner, and the biggest problem we had in running distance was our heads. They were teenage brains, right? But as you get to the point where you're older, you can better control your body, and distance runners can extend their peak quite a bit further. But sprinters, they're toast at 30, okay? Children in their early teens perform beyond expectations when we let them. Remember, 13 to 26 is the body's best performance. Society might want to modify that, but the bodies are still very capable. So women swimmers, uh, Missy Franklin has three gold medals, the age of 16. Il Volo, does anybody know Il Volo, the Italian group? They're outstanding. If you haven't heard Il Volo, yeah, they're, they're amazing, and these kids are 16 years old. Justin Bieber, oh well. Um, <laughs> students earning their PhDs at Berkeley. Uh, Andrew Hsu uh, got his PhD in Berkeley at the age of 18 and a half. And uh, it was in a science. Young mothers across the world, after age 27, just look in the mirror for the proof that you're on the downhill slope. But here's, <laughs> here's Missy Franklin, Il Volo, Andrew Hsu, and two 13-year-old mothers in, uh, in the Sudan. And I'm just pointing out that reproductively, these are adults, all of these people. Being programmed reproductive modules affects our behavior. Basic reproductive behavior is hardwired in all life forms. If you take a look at those things that evolve, reproductive behavior is one of the slowest to change. Why do you think? If you change reproductive behavior, maybe you don't reproduce at all. See, there's a successful line that you have to follow. So reproductive behavior tends to be what we'd call conservative. Human reproductive behavior has a key nuance as males and females have dramatically different costs of reproduction. Males have an infinitesimal cost of reproduction. Females a very high cost of reproduction. I'm not going to beat this one to death. For females, menstruous, long pregnancy with high cost, high cost of a dependent child for several years, short reproductive years, and low fecundity. These are all things that reduce reproductive opportunity for females and escalate cost. Um, for males, reproductive cost, reproductive cost is very low. Sperm, sperm are produced cheaply by the millions. There's no required biological investment in the offspring. And we know this from even in today's society. Often a man will copulate the baby, oh, I'm pregnant, gone. So the female at that point is involved in a commitment with her genes for a period of several years, right? The male has successfully reproduced. His genes are passed on just the same as the female. And this inequity shapes some of our behavior. Um, but for males, fecundity is virtually limitless. And the programming for any male with a low cost of reproduction is basically mate with anything that moves, right? <laughs> And this was very interesting on NPR. It was yesterday they were talking about something they discovered about the giant squid, which lives in the depths down up to half a mile and more. Giant squid get to be 35 to 50 feet long, but they're in a very dark environment. And they said they, they had this researcher was trying to figure out how the males could tell the females from the males. They don't. They just mate with any squid that comes by. You know, I mean, <laughs> because you can't tell. And, it didn't require much behavioral change in the males to do this. <laughs> OK. Differential reproductive cost steers our behavior. Males with a low cost of reproduction and no penalty for making a mistake may try to mate with any willing female. Um, I used to go in and give this speech to Gene Cunningham's uh, Sexuality of Women class. I felt like a target. You know, I mean, because this is not something that's a judgmental point of view from a biologist. This is just fact. 
uh, sexual selection is what I did my doctoral work on at Santa Barbara. It was my major professor studied sex change in races. And you might say, why did you pick him? I didn't. He was the only guy that would take a graduate student. He was new. So <laughs> that's why I worked with Bob. Bob was a great professor, though. Right? Females with a high cost of reproduction, low fecundity, and a high cost of making a mistake tend to be far more selective about mate choice. Since the female has more risk and higher cost, the female requires the male to have certain characteristics before she'll mate with him. This is not true of humans at all, right? right? <laughs> um, being selective tends to shape traits in males, a process called sexual selection. Males need special traits to mate. If you've ever seen a male peacock, I mean, it's just amazing. Thing can't even fly to speak of, right? But boy, can it get the females, right? All that tail feather, all that coloration. The fish that I like to keep, the killifish, the males are unbelievable. They have this ornamentation. They can barely swim, but they mate, right? The females are little brown torpedoes, eating machines that gather calories, lay eggs, and reproduce. And there's no selection of males on females. Remember, the male will mate with anything that moves? So the females are whatever natural selection made them. The males are whatever female mate choice made them. And that explains a lot of the color difference that you see. In modern humans, these may be translated somewhat into what are females looking for? Good looks, size and strength, high social standing slash wealth, car, home, education, and being a good provider. And again, I'm a biologist, not a social science, so you can pick me apart if you want. Right? And these are some products of primate sexual selection. Here you can see the brightly colored face here. Here you can see the male gorilla with the big sagittal crest and the big muscles. And here you can see the male bonobo with the bigger uh, uh, brow ridges, larger size than the female. And here's what we've selected for. <laughs> All right. For some, male behavior has not changed from our ancestral roots. Some in human males will try to mate with anyone that is willing, and this is not limited to younger males. We're talking about humans now. I'm not talking about animals, right? <coughs> Um, the number of babies born out of wedlock, abortions, rape, and general male promiscuity provide evidence to this hypothesis. Successful reproduction for our ancestors involves some risk, and modern men seem to have a drive to seek out risk. Uh, Mike Allen told me this over volleyball, so it must be true. Um, <laughs> powerful men who have exhibited such risky behavior when it comes to sexual dalliances include Bill Clinton, JFK, Elliot Spitzer, John Edwards, Mark Sanford, Anthony Weiner, Kobe Bryant, and Magic Johnson. Um, folks, I, the list was endless. I had to cut it off. And here, here are the stars of our show. Notice that these are powerful, influential men, right? People who really have life at their fingertips. And yet, the risk, something that drives us to risk. Because for a male, and I'm not condoning this behavior, I'm just saying this is the programming, if you take a risk and you successfully reproduce, what happens to those genes? They get passed on. What about the male who takes no risk and doesn't pass the genes on? Those genes are not passed on, all right? Are byproducts of sexual selection affecting males? Let's see. In selecting for human males with size and strength, the ability to defend home territory and offspring, females have selected for males who are aggressive and territorial with high testosterone levels. I remember the 70s when women said, why can't I find a sensitive man? They're all so aggressive, you know, and what happened? And I basically can say from a biological point of view, you have yourselves to blame, right? Females have selected for the traits that led to the protection of their offspring, which, remember, our, we were evolving, stopped evolving about a million and a half years ago. Note, testosterone levels decline when males do infant care and rise to normal in a few years. This just came out in the news. Did anybody hear this? Fascinating. This is a neat adaptation of protecting the female's investment. So females are selecting for something in males. They're selecting for males that are aggressive, that can defend the territory and all that stuff. But then as soon as the baby's born, they're selecting for a male whose testosterone level goes down so he can be a fellow parent. This stuff is amazing. I mean, you wonder how this could have evolved, but it's a neat adaptation. Being social organisms with a dominance hierarchy, human males had to compete with other males to obtain mates and reproductive success. Modern human males seem to have this competitive programming, and this may explain transfer of this competitive streak into sports. The male's express, uh, uh, obsession with sports and combat and fighting, boxing and all that, may be just an, a logical extension 
of our programming. Okay? I'm not saying women can't do it. I'm just saying men are driven to do it as part of our programming. Um, our society tends to also support this behavior, if you notice. Right? But if you look at little children, like in Burma, I remember little kids in Burma, who aren't under the same social system. If you looked at a little boy out in back of his house, he probably had a stick, was trying to torment some creature. If you look at a little girl, the behavior was more nurturing. Building things, you know, holding the pet, that kind of stuff. And we do have this programming. It doesn't, I'm not saying that's all we are, but remember I'm a biologist, right? All right, males who settled down with a single female had a reproductive output limited by their female's reproductive ceiling. Males who ventured out from their mate increased reproductive success and passed on more genes. This behavior may have been selected for, it seems to have been. Male risk taking often led to higher reproductive success. Again, risk taking and investments can lead to higher financial gain. Possibly our obsession with the stock market. This is a risk taking thing where there's a cost benefit and I'm, again, I'm stretching folks, all right? I'm admitting it. Primate social structure and modern human culture. Modern human culture seems to derive heavily from our origins as social primates. Most current human social structure is still male dominant as in higher apes, okay? Our origins were in tribal groups that parallel what we see in primate groups. So if you take a look at primitive cultures, a lot, there's a lot of parallels that you see with um, what we know about early human cultures. Cooperative behavior in primates is based in kin selection. One of the things that we've struggled with is if there's all this, you know, competition. Competition for mates, competition for resources. why should anything cooperate with anything else? Why should there be any sort of, you know, social cooperation? And there was a Canadian guy named Vern Wynne Edwards. He had to be Canadian, folks. It's a very socialist concept. And what he did was he said, well, if we create a model and we've got two types of organisms. They're both the same species, but one group we'll call altruists, and the other group we'll call non-altruists, and they're genetically programmed. So what happens is the altruists, when the resources start to crash, when there's less food, when the environment is less water, the environment is more stressful, they will voluntarily curtail reproduction so that the size of the population that needs to be supported by the environment is small. What do the non-altruists do? They reproduce like flies, and they, so according to Vern Edwards, the non-altruistic gene is gonna make these reproduce like crazy, they're gonna eat up their environment, they'll pollute the environment, and the population will crash. And of course, the wonderful thing about publishing a paper is you get to go through what's called peer review, and then after that, you get to put it in a scientific journal and watch everybody fire, you know, back at you. And the first American that read Vern Edwards' thing says, there's only one problem with your hypothesis, Mutations occur all the time. And I'm assuming that in the altruistic population, there's a possibility that you might have a mutant who's a non-altruist. So now you got one non-altruist surrounded by altruists, what's he gonna do? Reproduce with everything, no matter what, and which gene is gonna take over? The non-altruist gene, see? So what is the explanation for cooperative behavior? If you didn't get that, I'll explain it afterwards. But um, the explanation is what we call kin selection. If you are genetically related to another individual and you help them to reproduce, what are you doing to your genes? You're helping to transfer them, okay? Um, for instance, my sister has two children. When I was growing up, I helped to take care of the children, okay? Those children are 50% related to me, right? They are, they're 50% related to me, because say it's the same gene line as my sister, we basically are both related to our parents by 50%. If I help my sister raise her two kids, what have I done? I had a kid. My genes have been passed on, right? One full set of genes by helping my sister raise two kids. This is kin selection. And there's all kinds of interesting examples of kin selection that, that I won't go into. Um, despite our best efforts in modern society, humans tend to be more likely to help their kinfolk than members of non-related human groups. And I think this biological mandate is one of the things that causes us to send to see differences in, in social groups rather than similarities. It's possible that what we're doing is looking for the similar ones that we can help reproduce as a means of passing on our genes. And again, folks, this is called sociobiology. It's very controversial, but it's fun to look at, all right? 
as biology predicts, we tend to fight with others who are similar in their needs, who we perceive to be very different from ourselves. If you take a look at the most violent wars, they're between groups that are so similar to each other, right? I'm not gonna pick any because it's politically incorrect. But if you sit there and think of similar populations of people that have fought like cats and dogs over resources, an outsider would probably see them as very similar to each other. And the fact that they're competing for the same resources is part of the game. Okay, animals often fight over limiting resources with members of other kin groups. These fights can lead to death. Modern war seems to be analogous to these kin group competitions. If you take a look at what happened in Sudan, if you went into Sudan, would you think that the people in northern Sudan are remarkably different from southern Sudan if you met them on the street? Probably not. But the Sudanese, northern Sudanese and southern Sudanese, see each other as totally different from each other. Their ideas are incompatible, and you have to, the only way to survive is to split, right? All right, our brain size separates from other, us from other primates. This is kind of cool. This is just skulls of early hominids. And I like to see the separation point is right about here. Above 800 cc's, these things are on the line of evolution of humans. Below 800 cc's, these are things that are either apes or early pre-humans. All the Australopithecus means southern ape in Latin. And Paranthropus, this is the vegetarian one. And here's uh, Pan troglodytes, the chimp, and the gorilla. But these are all animals with increasing brain size. And if you take a look at the brain case of a gorilla in comparison to the size of its face, and then take a look at the brain case and the size of humans in comparison to the size of his face. If you were to ask a gorilla, you know, what's a human look like? They'd say, well, they don't have much of a face on them. I mean, there's practically nothing there. You know, and it doesn't stick out very much. It's not very aggressive or functional, right? Our brain, is it our curse or our salvation? The hominid body below the neck stopped evolving about one and a half million years ago. I already said that. Um, certainly, in human evolution, there were Ice Age specialists, um, pygmies, and there were diversifications of human forms that we're beginning to find that are kind of interesting. We thought, we tend to think of this out of Africa, one line of evolution. But as we look around the world, we're finding very interesting humans that existed in the past. The one thing that clearly makes us human is the size of the brain. And complex brains plus tool use in our social structure led to humans separating themselves from our animal ancestors. Um, when I go down into the rainforest, you know, it's, it's interesting because you like to think I'm one with the rainforest. But what does everything do as I'm walking? Get the hell out of the way. You know, there's this strange smelly creature with no hair. Right, and it's carrying stuff that is weird, like a camera, you know, and a backpack and a, a net. And we are clearly a different sort of thing. And the activities that we carry out when we're in the environment are very different from what other animals do. We have created great cities, we have dammed rivers, we've created works of art and literature, music, governments. It's hard to begin to appreciate the sum accomplishments of the human race in a lifetime. And I mean this, I'm, I'm at awe. There's so little that any person can know in their lifetime about the accomplishments of the human species. It's just uh, unbelieving. That's why we're here in education. It, it keeps our, our brains challenged, right? We've also driven thousands of species to extinction. We've destroyed millions of acres of rainforest, polluted our air and water, and killed millions of people. I um, just want to talk a little bit about this. How much of the rainforest have we actually destroyed? Well, if you look at the year 1900 as the base year, people say, save the Amazon. Amazon's not doing too bad. 77% of the Amazon is still there. The forest is still there. Most of it's still primary growth. If you look at the Congo, right, what used to be the Belgian Congo, which is now just Congo and the surrounding countries, about 55% of the Congo is still there. The French went through and logged the Holy Dickens out of it, destroyed Madagascar. But most of the Congo is still there. But remember, I was raised in Burma. Southeast Asia, what percentage of the Southeast Asian rainforest is left? 24%. 24%. Like Borneo, Sumatra, Indonesia, all the areas that we're looking at where the orangutan lives are, are threatened very seriously by development and by lumbering. And I'll give a pitch to Darren and Victoria's Bali trip if you want to go see what's left, right? along with a side trip to Sumatra, or is it Borneo? Borneo? Borneo, sorry. At any rate, 
But you know, this is, this is scary because we need natural resources and the, natural, the rainforest is a major source of these resources. Every time you go buy some cool thing and cost plus, you know, and the wood is there and you sit there and think, wow, neat wood, it's actually made of wood. It came from some rainforest tree. And being raised in Burma, I used to love to go and see at, uh, oh, what's the name of the place? It used to be called Nordic Trends. There was another one uh, that was called uh, Danish Design, but any of the Danish modern stuff. And you now buy this furniture and it says, Plantation Teak from Thailand. Has anybody been to Thailand? Have you seen plantations of teak? No. No, that's Burmese timber that's smuggled across the northern border from wild growth that's illegally cut down and brought in, and then they put plantation teak from Thailand on it, okay? And I, I guess one of the things I can ask you to be is a, an informed consumer. We take pride in our great accomplishments and strive for even greater things. We reflect on the damage we have done and find ways to balance the needs of humans with the needs of other life forms. Basically, I'm seeing in this decade an awareness, kind of a green movement. People are starting to ask themselves, what are the trade-offs? You know, we have all these amazing things, we have all these material goods, but at what cost? And I notice people are looking at recycling, they're looking at solar energy. Just look at the automobiles that are for sale right now, right? The behemoths that got eight miles to the gallon are now not economically feasible. People are driving the Prius and other high uh, efficiency vehicles. We still tend to, Still, we tend to demand justifications for not exploiting biological entities. Why shouldn't we go in and extract the timber from this place? Why shouldn't we go in and mine this? You know, why shouldn't we do damming of rivers and so on and so forth? But again, we're seeing some of these justifications being reversed. If you've looked at what's happened to dams in the, uh, in the Northwest, the dams are coming down because it's affecting so many habitats and it's destroying the salmon. And even if all you enjoy is wild salmon rather than farm-raised salmon, you can come up with a justification as to why these dams have to come down. All right. We have allowed large multinational companies to displace or exterminate native peoples in order to extract timber or mineral resources. Um, I used to belong to an organization called Rainforest Action Network, and they were very concerned about the people of Irian Jaya. Do you guys know where Irian Jaya is? The other half of Papua New Guinea, it's Indonesia. And people were being exterminated so that the Indonesians could cut down timber and sell it to the Japanese. Because folks, I'm not picking on the Japanese, but what natural resources base do the Japanese have? How many forests do they have? How many mines do they have? How, you know, they are dependent on everybody else in Southeast Asia. And the Japanese by themselves are largely responsible for a lot of the disappearance of the rainforest in Southeast Asia. I'm not blaming the Japanese because I'm going to point the finger on us in just a minute, but it's a reality. They're a manufacturing nation that has to get resources. They have to come from somewhere else. Fortunately, some cultural anthropologists rushed to learn about the forest people being displaced and discovered their knowledge of natural pharmaceuticals. This is really big right now in southern Venezuela, southern Colombia, the Yanomami tribe. And you have these um, anthropologists that are going in and learning the native medicine people's knowledge so that they can start to learn what are the molecules, what are the genes in these leaves of these plants that we can exploit. And some of the ones that have come up with are blood pressure meds, drugs that aid menstrual cramping. There was a woman anthropologist who had horrible menstrual cramping and one of the medicine men said, chew on this leaf. And she said, for the first time in my life, I didn't have these devastating menstrual cramps. And they're working that drug right through the FDA right now. Um, curing lymphoma, kill insect pests, etc. Now the race is on to discover new genes in rainforests before they're gone. And this is what I was told, telling you about disappearance of rainforests. We can't make new genes to improve human lives. That would take the thousands of years in trial and error. Evolution has already made millions of complex of genes after millions of years in trial and error for evolution. If, even if you're a capitalist and you're looking at a profit motivation, you shouldn't be going and destroying biological diversity because millions of years of evolution have created these incredible genes that make incredible products. And this is the future of medicine, this is the future of technology, this is the future of our species, is to learn what's been going on for the last, in many cases, uh, 500 million years. The future is now. 
The famous quote from Pogo, we have met the enemy and he is us, rings all too true today. Think about it. We have met the enemy and he is us, right? And not in all things, folks, but when it comes to our interaction in the environment, we are the problem, those of us with the brains and the tools and the technology. Our exponential increase in population, over-exploitation of natural resources, pollution of air and water, and our dramatic modification of all things biological are a threat to the future of life as we know it. I don't know if you know, but um, they had a world conference in Europe back in, oh geez, it was about 1992. And what's the world population today, folks? It's about seven billion. At that time, they said, if we could stop the human population in 6.2 billion, we could have a Western European lifestyle for every human being on the planet. What's a Western European lifestyle? Well, people have common areas, great big parks, right? Common swimming pools. They have uh, public transportation. They have a very good lifestyle. They eat well, they travel, they're well educated. But it isn't all about private ownership of property. But these scholars basically said, if we could stop the world at 6.1 billion, we could do that. Well, it takes time for these things. We've blown past the 6.1 billion. We're off at uh, 20, uh, 7 billion. And the increase in the human population is something we still haven't resolved. Discovery of antibiotics and pesticides freed humans from many sources of suffering and death. Now these agents have selected for superbug strains of E. coli, Ebola virus, flu, and staphylococcus that are resistant to all current drug therapies. How many times have you read about somebody who has an incurable bacterial infection? Right, the nurses are all nodding. This is a huge problem. The attention to um, antisepsis in the hospitals has gone way up. We used to be able to do quick and dirty medicine and it didn't really matter because the bugs that were attacking us could be killed with penicillin. Now we have these soupy bugs, these flesh-eating bacteria and such that we have to be far more careful and the more we go to um, synergized therapy where we're putting a couple of drugs together to try to kill something that we used to do with one drug, we're selecting for more and more dangerous organisms. We have placed genes in crop plants to protect them from pests. I don't know if you know about this, but there's all these cool genes that you can put into corn and wheat and cotton. And these genes basically then, basically secrete chemicals that kill the normal pests of these crops. Well, what's happened to these genes? The genes are now jumping to weeds and jumping to other species. And so this is one of the concerns that people have about you know, what we're doing. What we do is manipulating life but we don't always have the ability to anticipate the results. There is hope. The Western world is moving slowly away from total dependence on fossil fuels to solar and or wind and hybrid cars. We're starting to get it. One of the first things I plan to do in retirement is call Solar City and get the rebate and put the solar panels on my roof and go off the grid most of the time. Okay? Um, is that a zero cost thing? Let's be real. There's a huge cost to making those panels, folks. There's a cost to the environment. There's pollution. You're probably buying materials that are coming from some other third world nation. So it's not a simple game, but it's a start. Our exponential increase in population continues to be a core problem. Nonetheless, many cultures are beginning to embrace the idea of fewer children with a higher quality of life and better education. Um, instead of just having what you used to call third world countries, we now have more emerging nations the five tigers and others in, in Southeast Asia. And there is an emphasis on a better quality of life, okay? Not just children. Uh, my dad, incidentally, was one of 10 children. He was a farm in Southern Illinois. And of course, dad told me right up, he says, my parents had a lot of kids because we were free labor, right? We were free labor to work in the fields. We didn't have to hire anybody. We didn't have health care plans. We just worked in the field. Today, if you have a kid, that's for tech support. Okay. <laughs> Restoring many modified natural areas by removing dams, reducing, uh, reintroducing species, and restoration of forests and wetlands. We saved the American uh, California condor. We've saved the Santa Cruz Island fox. We're saving many species by pulling them out of the wild when their populations get small. And everybody said, this won't work, it's futile. It's working. The problem is we gotta reintroduce the habitat to put them back into. And people are starting to realize that as well. 
beginning to use the body's own augmented natural immune system to better fight disease. The future in disease battle is not better pharmaceuticals. It's better ability to turn on your body's own immune system to do what it does best. And uh, one of the things I learned when I was teaching biology to the majors is every year I had to rewrite my lecture on the immune system. Because as soon as I wrote it, it was obsolete. Everything we know about the immune system changes so rapidly, we're still just beginning to scratch the surface. Biotechnology has allowed us to manu mass manufacture many key human sourced products. I won't go into the long list, but it's impressive. The challenges that remain. Capitalistic economies are still very dependent on natural resources and compete globally to get them. A lot, I won't get into your political science and world politics stuff, but I think it's safe to say the United States' interest in a lot of foreign nations is based on resources, right? Um, the US, U.S. consumes, you ready for this, 25% of the world's total resources with 4% of the world's population. We are 4% of the world's population consuming one quarter of the world's total resources. We also consume 34% of the world's wood and paper products. Our interest in other countries, as I said, is often based on their natural resources. The one good thing about our wood and paper products is we're recycling most of our own. We're not getting much of it from outside, except for pine, which we're getting from Chile. Um, now many emerging economies across the world, they're listed, um, are beginning to demand more resources to support their industry and standard of living. We're worried not so much about pollution in the United States, we're worried about pollution in Southeast Asia. <coughs> because Southeast Asia is growing tremendously in terms of its uh, manufacturing and uh, use of resources. Humans need to embrace the common human spirit and not use perceived differences in justification for conflict. I'm overstepping my bounds as a biologist, but really, I see this as a driver in the world today. Just read the newspaper, folks. How many of you read section one of the Times? How much of it is anything but warfare and conflict? Right? I mean, basically, that's what it is. The growing gulf between the haves and the have-nots threatens to lead to increased conflict. <coughs> Folks, most people in the world today fear not so much global devastation of resources, but this increasing gulf between the haves and the have-nots, where you've got the very poor and you've got the very rich. And even on Channel 11 this morning, which is just la-la news, they were talking about how there's now more obese people in the world than there are people who are starving. So that gulf is tremendous. Um, humans have the brains, the brawn, and the technology to save the natural world while embracing the best humanity has created. We need to save a magical world to pass on to our children. I think that's the one thing that may unify us all. The, need, the, the responsibility to our world to pass something on to our kids. I want my kid to be able to experience what I was able to experience. I don't want her to go into, you know, oh, never mind. I won't. What was, what, was that, what was that stupid movie about L.A. and the future? It's, why can't I think of it? Blade Runner. Yeah, I don't want my kid in Blade Runner. So here are the children we're, we're saving. This is from the Amazon, folks, a little child. And a little girl with a parrot. Boy with a large carachama. Some people I know. <laughs> the rainforest. The end. Thank you. Take them, so fire away. Well, uh, don't say it that way. <laughs> Ron. Yes. Do you think that uh, natural selection has done a good job in selecting for uh, college administrators? <laughs> hey, Peter. We 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 call that we call that retrograde evolution, where the good traits that are in the faculty sort of sort of atrophy and disappear. Parasites do the same thing. Yeah. All right. Are all these obese people rich people who eat too much or poor people with bad diets? That's a very good point, and they pointed that out. A lot of times if you're living in the third world and the only cheap source is carbohydrates, if you look at uh, throughout the world where I've traveled, rice and beans, manioc root, 
you know, anything that's a carbo source. Yeah, and they're often, if you've seen the kids who have kwashiorkor in Africa, it's the belly is there because of uh, amino acid deficiencies. So they're not getting enough protein in their diet. Yeah. Other things? Yes. If we are uh, descendants from carnivores, why is it that it seems like we get a lot of trouble from, from eating meat, for mm -hmm. instance, red meat? Stuff like this, but everybody says you know that we need to eat more plants, more um, more vegetables. If you take a look at, uh, like, there was a bear in our neighborhood last night. I mean, literally. If you guys read the news, you'll read about the end of Cedar Bend. And I was there watching TV. I was watching the Monday Night Football, and, and then all of a sudden I hear, everybody stay indoors. <laughs> and so I go and look out the window, and there's the cops, all, all of them headed in there, and there's this bear. Um, bears are in the carnivora, the order carnivora, but they're omnivorous. They eat both uh, fruit, grain, and meat. It all depends on what's available. Uh, but the ancestors that we come from, if you look at their dentition, uh, they were clearly carnivorous. But being a carnivore doesn't mean you never eat any plant material or any grain. It just means you're, uh, if you have a brain that's big, you've got to feed it. And in order, to, even though the brain feeds on glucose, a lot of the diet, it's hard to support a large, lively brain feeding plant material into it. Uh, the meat diet gets you more calories in the long run. Okay? Yeah, I think, uh, thank you very much for a wonderful, wonderful lecture. I learned a lot. And, and my question is, what if we, if we were just a four-legged animals as before? Do you think we might have a less healthy issues? Well, that's hard to say. Um, <laughs> I'm going to go back to what John said about meat, and I'll get to you. Um, the, the problems we have with meat in our diet, I think, are largely related to stress. And if you, they, they did a study of Vietnam, Vietnam vets. They were looking at cadavers of men killed in Vietnam. And because they were in the military, they knew the guys that were vegetarians. They knew the guys that were carnivores. And what was interesting is that all of them had very thick plaque in their arteries. <laughs> And the plaque wasn't caused by diet, it was caused by stress. And if you take a look at, say, like the Dutch and the Danish, we eat a lot of cheese, milk products, pork, and all that, but live in a socialistic society that takes care of them quite well, they have very low heart disease. I'm right on this, right? I mean, it's, it's, so it's, it's not just diet. A lot of it has to do, my Republican friends are groaning here. Um, anyway, so let's go back. Say one more time because I lost it. Your question? I'm talking about me? Yeah. Okay, as a four-legged animal, you're not gonna have lower back pain. Um, you're not gonna have hemorrhoids. Um, you're not gonna have a tiny bladder during pregnancy. You know, there's a lot of these things that, because the, the quadrupedal uh, body was evolved over far longer time than bipedalism. We were quadrupedal. Two million years is nothing. That's a microsecond in, in evolution. So, and since our brains took us out of evolution and turned us into social evolution, right, the, brain, the body's not really evolving that much anymore. We're not getting better. When's the last time you saw your friend eaten by a saber-toothed tiger before they could reproduce, you know? It just doesn't happen that way. Go ahead. Uh, do you think that the environmental problems and this growing gap between the haves and the have-nots can actually be solved under this current economic system that creates it? That's a question for you, not for me. Yeah. <laughs> Biologist. All right, Jenny. Um, I find that uh, Professor Rapuya was saying, when we talk about eating meat, how long have cows been around? Because I know beef has always been an issue as far as being unhealthier for us to eat versus fowl and fish. Are, have cows been around forever? Well, no. Um, Boy, anthropologist who wants to help me out here. When, when did we start domesticating cattle? Eight, thousand. Ten thousand years Eight ten thousand years ago? Okay. But, you know, I just, again, I always used to tell my students, there's one key decision that will determine the rest of your life. One decision, and only one. And that's who your mother and father are and what sperm and egg come together. And that's the one you have no control over because your genetic endowment controls so much of who you are. People have marveled at my linguistic ability. I don't work very hard at languages, folks. It's just, you know, it's, it's something that's there. My mother was very linguistic. 
she didn't speak any foreign languages, but she knew so much, and she shared that with me. And you know, that, that was a genetic endowment. I'm, I was also supposed to be six foot eight. That didn't happen. Okay. <laughs> I have a sister who's six one. Go ahead, Fred. So you told us about the past. What can you tell us about the future? <clears throat> you know, I think the best way to understand the future is to read science fiction. I think science fiction authors spend a lot of time bringing together all the variables and think about this. If you read uh, Arthur C. Clarke and Robert Heinlein and all these like I did back in the 50s and 60s, so much of what they projected is true. Uh, Dick Tracy, you know, with the wrist communicator. I was sitting there going, oh, that'll never happen. You know, and, and yeah, so many things were predicted and I, I would read a lot of science fiction. I'm serious, I think that's where a lot of people, science fiction are often scientists who are creative. And Biological, Avatar kind of stuff? No, Avatar's fantasy, that's not science fiction, it's a little different. Fantasy is not really grounded in anything that's here today. Uh, science fiction is grounded, at least to my knowledge, with what we have today and an extrapolation from there. But no, I really don't know. I, I think, you know, we all know what we're headed for. We're all headed for uh, fewer resources for each person. We're all headed for the realization, I'm sorry folks, global warning is real. I mean, scientists do not say, absolutely beyond a shadow of doubt, I know this is happening. We sit there and talk about statistical probability. It's the way we talk, just like administrators talk about plausible deniability. Um, <laughs> anyway, but you know, you have, you have the truth in global warming. You have the truth in the fact that you can't drink the water in California out of a stream without getting Giardia. The Sierra Cup, folks, get rid of that thing. You know, use it to take the poop out of your cat box. It's no good in the, in the streams of the Sierra. You're gonna get Giardia because all the pack animals up there have transferred it. But I, I think that you're looking at trying to adjust to a period where, you know, owning more material goods was everything, probably to an adjustment back to some sort of reality that we can't continue in the direction we're going. I mean, uh, I'm not picking on you, Kindy, but big SUVs are, are a thing of the past, right? I love my car. I know you do. <laughs> and just so you know, folks, I own a motorhome I got stuck with in the divorce, so I'm, I'm bad too. Anyway. Ron, can I ask you just sure. one last question? Yeah. We're go just about there. Yeah. Uh, in terms of uh, the, uh, the, the, the reducing the size of population since, you know, we are over 6.2 billion. What is the best way to reduce the population? Make all men, you know, the Mr. Mom. Why are you social scientists asking me social science questions? <laughs> I'm a biologist. I'm the, I did my... my well, that's what I'm asking you. As a biologist, what are suggestions? Well, you're going to have to... I, I think... Okay, I will come up with this. I think you're going to have to recognize that 13 to 16-year-old children are little adults trying to be little adults. And if you think that they're gonna not try to reproduce, you're crazy. I mean, you know, thinking that these are, these are children, they're not children. And when society, yes, you can actually change that, but, but deal with it as reality. Don't pretend that your kid's gonna be a child and not gonna be interested in sex. You know, that's just, there, there is that interest there, the drive is there. You're, you're looking shocked, but. Um, <laughs> The other thing I think you have to deal with is take a look at cultures where a person's status, especially a male's status, is measured by how many children he has and substitute something else for that. Find a way that that is not the way that one measures their personal status by how many kids they have. That's the best way, I think, to try to, to deal with that from a biological perspective. Okay, I think we need to stop there. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it.